So I've got the uh, privilege of speaking to you about humility. Uh, that's because I am probably the most qualified person in the room <laughs> to speak on humility. The irony of such a statement. If this morning you think you are humble, there is great irony in that. And you probably need to uh, pin your ears back. As do we all. If you are teachable this morning and you are moldable and you are sort of chomping at the bit to hear something good this morning, then you're in a good place because humility is teachable. You see, humility is sort of understanding all the things which contribute to who you are and how you got to where you are. You see, because in the light of all the universe... Okay, so let's just look at the universe. Let's look at creation. Let's look at God creating the world and realizing that we, in that, are a very small part in the light of creation, in the light of eternity, in the light of the beginning of time to the end of time, in the light of the many people who have been before us and done amazing things and great exploits and conquered nations and all sorts of incredible things. And there will be many amazing things that go after us and we are just a little blip somewhere on that dotted line. But you know what? Humility isn't forgetting that you were born for such a time as now. And trying to balance those two things of being like humble, but realizing that you were born to do something, to achieve something for greatness, that's a real battle. (laughs) That's why I think a lot of people struggle with humility because it's like, I want to be humble, but uh, I want to believe that I was born for greatness. And we sort of get lost somewhere in the middle of this battle of humility. So some people are like, they just decide, well, I'm just going to be humble. Woe is me. I'm a worm. Uh, I'm not bothered about ever doing anything. And then you get some other people who are at the other end of the line. They're like, I'm awesome. Stop me if you can. Do you know what I mean? I can do anything. Be anyone. And it's like, okay, cool. But just a little bit of humility wouldn't go amiss. So what I want to do this morning is just look at that ever present battle of our life and of our society. Uh, Sort of being humble, but believing that we were designed and created for greatness. Okay, so in the Bible, at the very beginning, God makes man. Anyone glad he didn't stop there? <laughs> About three people. And uh, now it says in the Bible, that this is what God says. He says, he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. Now, I've been thinking about that, and what I think happened is God realized that man needed a woman to keep him humble, and that's why it wasn't good for him to be alone, because he was like, I own this place. (laughs) This is my garden. God thought, I'll humble you, son. (laughs) Along came Eve. Along came women. My wife keeps me humble. Good. (laughs) Okay. What is humility? Let's start with there, shall we? So the dictionary defines humility as this. The quality of having a modest or low view of one's self-importance. C.S. Lewis, a very uh, excellent author, said this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Such a clever play on words. Should we stop there? Should we go home? (laughs) Okay. So why should we be humble? So we're looking at what humility is. Humility isn't, woe is me, I'm a worm. Um, It's thinking of ourself less, putting ourself at the front less. Me, me, me. What do I get out of this? What can I gain from this? How can I win in this? It's thinking of ourselves less, putting other people before ourselves. So why should we be humble? Well, you know what? Humility is incredibly attractive. Not just in church, but in the world. People love humble people. You know, when you meet someone who's really successful, 
done really well for themselves, built themselves like a big business or a successful family or done really well, you know, 28,000 degrees and, you know, whatever else, they're a doctor and all that, but they're really humble with it. It's like, oh, that's awesome. But you could meet the same person and they're like, I'm the boss. And you'd be like, you're an idiot. <laughs> Yeah, you're smart and successful, but please, I don't want to have a brew with you. Because, like, you know, you, you just, there's something really not attractive about arrogance and pride and people who think they're like, they are awesome because they are awesome. They did it all. They know it all. Humility is teachable. So what I want to do this morning is I want to look at uh, the Bible. What the Bible says about humility. You see, because Jesus being the son of God. Okay, so if you're a Christian this morning, if you say you're a follower of Jesus this morning, then I've got some good news or bad news, depending on how you look at this, but humility is not optional. (laughs) Ah, gutted. I was thinking I could like leave this place and be like, oh, that's nice for some. But you know, if you've made the decision, if you've made the decision to follow Jesus this morning, it isn't nice for some. It's like mandatory requirement of Christianity. It's like a trademark of the faith. Because actually without humility, you can't really come to a place where you say sorry. And that's like the starting point of salvation. The starting point of being a Christian is this place where you go, actually, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of such news this morning. And the good thing about speaking about humility is if you don't get anything from it, it's not because I did a bad job. (laughs) <laughs> it's because you weren't humble and teachable. <laughs> yeah. So, I just want to use, uh, the, they're not going to come up on the screen. You don't have to turn there. I just want to throw a few Bible verses at you, a bit quick fire, just to sort of bring a little bit of clout to what I'm saying about humility. So 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 6 says this, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. James chapter 4, verse 10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Matthew 23, verse 12 says this, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Philippians 2, verses 6 and 8, when speaking about Jesus, says this of him, He humbled himself. Humility is not a gift. It's a choice. It's a way of life. It's not something some people have been gifted with and are just good at. They're really good at being humble. Oh, it's so natural. No, it's a choice. That's why the Bible says humble yourself. It doesn't say that God, well, it does say God will humble you, but that's if you've exalted yourself. So unlucky if that's the case. I don't want to be humbled by God. (laughs) Think about it. I don't want to be humbled by God because that actually means that I've put myself in a position that God says, Luke, you need to come down a peg or two, son. You need to chill your beef. (laughs) You know what I mean? You've climbed that ladder a bit too quick on your own. I'm just going to bring you down a few rungs. That's what happens if God's humbling you. That's what the Bible says. So I I want to humble myself. I hope you join me this morning and say, yeah, I'm up for that. I want to get in that boat of humbling myself. I don't want God to have to humble me. I want to humble myself. So humility is not a gift. It is very much a choice. So... Let me have a swig of my water and try not spill it down myself. That'd be humbling. Um, I want to look at a story in the Bible that if you've been in church for any length of time, you might know, you might be familiar with. If you've, you've never been to church, you might still know sort of about this story or around this story because this story took place at the Last Supper. And most people have heard of the Last Supper. It's sort of when Jesus has a last meal with his disciples before Um, being crucified before going into the garden and being arrested and and laying down his life. This takes place before that. So with that in mind, I'd like to look at John chapter 13, and I'm going to just read from verse 3 through to 17. So it's a few verses, but just bear with me. Uh, Pin your ears back, and let's just go on this. uh, Let's just enter that scene, if we may. Okay, so let's imagine we are observers or participants in the Last Supper. Okay, it says this. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power 
and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord, love Peter. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, my hands and my head as well. <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound. He probably didn't say in for a penny, in for a pound, but whatever in Greek that was, he probably said that. Jesus answered, Jesus answered, verse 10, those who have had a bath need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, that is an amazing story for so many reasons. And there are so many things we could look at that story and be like, wow. But what I want to do is I just want to look at three things Everyone say three things, three things and sort of do this, which is like, I think what the Boy Scouts do, but something of it was like three things. Okay. Some of you are like asleep, you've drifted off. Okay. So I just want to look at three things from this story about humility and give us a little bit of food for thought, hopefully stir up a little bit of thought and provoke a little bit of challenge and action. So my first point is this. It's from verse three. It's from the very start. And this is what it says. Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This is my first point. Humility is secure. That's my first S. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I've got three points. They all begin with S. The first one is secure. Oh, someone's ringing. <laughs> Hiya. Hiya, mom. Hiya, mom. It's really awkward. I'm in church. It's all right. This is like a real classic. This is like practical humility, uh, a practical humbling lesson. When your phone rings in a public place, it's very humbling and awkward and embarrassing. So I won't bring attention to it because uh, that'd, be, that'd be horrible of me. So I apologize. Um, verse three. Okay, so humility is secure. And what I mean by this is there's, there's loads of ways we can sort of look at this and take this apart. And, but you see, Jesus is, was, and knew he was the son of God. He left heaven, okay? Left heaven where he was equal to God. It says in the Bible that Jesus sort of didn't consider his equality with God, the father, so he's equal to God. He didn't sort of take, you know, make a, take advantage of that, make the most of that, like in the sense of being like, do you know who I am? So, so in this setting, Jesus is God. He's like, he is the person in that environment of highest position, yet he puts himself in a position of lowest position. And do you know why he can do that? Because he is secure in who he is, not what he's doing. He in no way thinks that in washing the disciples' feet, that looks bad on him or makes him lesser of a person. Oh, I can't make the bruise. If I'm making the bruise, everyone will think I'm a servant. I might, they might think less of me. It might make me look like I'm less than I am. Well, security, 
Humility is security. You are secure in who you are, not in what you do or in what you have. Because when you do what you do or have what you have isn't there anymore, there goes your security. So humility has this great place of security in actually being secure in who I am, who God has made me, what God says about me. You find total security in humility because humility understands, like Jesus says, I'm from God and that's where I'm returning. One day I'm going back. (laughs) He sent me. I am a child of God. If you're a Christian this morning, you are a child of God. That is where your security lies. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, your security this morning is not in your job. It's not in your career prospect. It's not in your family. It isn't in what you own and what you possess. If it is, it needs to change because those things are not secure. Those things are temporarily secure, which means they are insecure. And security is actually found in God, the Father. I am a child of God. He made me, he crafted me, he ordained my path, he orchestrated my life. I take great security in that. And you know what? Humility is secure. You know, the second thing from this story is humility serves others. You see, what's great about this story is Jesus serves his disciples. They are his disciples, that it says. So that actually means they follow him. He is the leader in this situation, but he serves them. The world defines greatness by how many people serve you. Heaven defines greatness by how many people you serve. That's the difference. I love the principles of heaven. I love the principles of the Bible and Christianity because they are so often backwards to the way of the world. The world goes, wow, they're so great. They've got a business, hundreds of employees, loads of people serve and wait on them. Hand and foot, they do what they say when they say it. And the world looks at that and thinks, wow, that is greatness. Yet Jesus says and displays that greatness isn't in actually who is serving you. It's actually by who you're serving, it's in who you're serving. And Jesus in this story serves his disciples. Not only does he serve them, he washes their smelly, stinky, sweaty, dirty feet. Give me a wave if you've ever, I'm not saying if you've categorically got smelly feet, but if you've ever had smelly feet, just give us a wave. Never. Yeah? Never ever. Yeah, you're lying, you're, you're lying. If you, if, you, if you haven't got your hand up, you're lying and you need to say sorry. No. Repent, <laughs> repent. I tell you, yeah? Now, in, in this, this, I don't know, someone's saying something funny on the front row about smelly feet. You know, in this story, washing, or in, at this time, you know, everyone always jokes about having Jesus sandals, don't they? Well, like, you know, with the sandals, there was a lot of dirt got sort of in and about your feet. And before they ate, because they were sort of eating quite low to the ground and they were quite close, it was like sort of tradition to wash feet. That's just what they did. They washed feet. And that was the job for the lowest of person. It was sort of the the, the job for the servant. It was the job for like the person that really you expected to do it. Yet here in this story, absolute flip side, the most important person, the most amazing person actually is the one who gets the basin and the towel. It says he takes his garment off. And I just love this thought that all the disciples are there sitting like, I'm not doing it. They're looking around thinking, where's the servant? (laughs) Because later, actually before this, a few of them were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. So you imagine this scene. Just just let's go there a second. You're all looking around thinking, who's going to do it? I'm not doing it. I'm not washing the feet. Forget that. You're waiting for like someone to appear. You're like waiting for a servant. Someone, I think, Jesus probably got it sussed. He's probably got someone. They're they're probably just late, running late, missed the bus. They'll be here in a minute. They're going to wash our feet. This is what it says about Jesus. Took off his outer garment. Don't worry, lads. I mean business. I've got this. And at that point, they all went, no, no, what, no, 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 no. Jesus, you you can't wash our feet. You imagine how humbling that moment was. Like, oh, you're joking. Oh, it should have been me. I'm... 
I should have been the one who, it should have been me. But no, Jesus is humbling them. Because they had exalted them to a place of, well, I'm not washing your feet. He says, don't you worry. I'll wash your feet. You imagine that moment. That's why when we get to point number three, Okay, point number three is this. Humility says sorry. That's why, back to the story, when Jesus comes to wash Peter's feet, he's like, whoa, 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 no chance. Like Peter in the Bible is known, he's quite notorious for being like outspoken, strong, a bit hot-headed, a bit quick to react. And he's like, whoa, Jesus, forget it. You are not washing my feet. One, they stink. And two, you are the son of God. No <laughs> chance. And Je- No, Lord. Don't wash my feet. I don't imagine. I know that's what it says, but let's just be real. Forget it. Jesus, you're not doing it. You're not making me a brew. I'm making you a brew. You are not, you're not buying dinner. I'm buying dinner. You're not washing my feet. I should be washing yours. And this is what Jesus says. This is amazing. It's what he says. Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. So Peter immediately is like, what, what, forget it. Give me a bath. Soak me. Where's the shower? I'm in. <laughs> now he doesn't say, I'm so sorry, Lord. <laughs> but that immediate transformation of action and thought tells me one thing. He was sorry. He admitted in that moment, I've made a mistake. I've got this wrong. Uh, hold up. I'm wrong. You're right. Jesus, you're right. I'm wrong. So let's just put things back in order. You see, humility says, sorry, often we think that it's noble that we admit our flaws and our mistakes or we acknowledge them. We think that there's something noble in being able to look at our life and say, oh, I've made mistakes, I'm a failure. And I think to a measure it is noble, but to a measure it's not because we're all failures. We've all made mistakes. So I don't think it's that noble to just acknowledge you are part of the human race and you have made a mistake like everyone else. What I do think is noble is when you open your mouth, you go to the person that your mistake affected and you say, I'm really sorry because I hurt you when I made that mistake. I'm really sorry, I've upset you. I am sorry, there is so much power in saying to someone, I am sorry I made a mistake. That is humble and humbling. Humility says sorry, because it admits it made a mistake. It it admits it got it wrong. And you know what, sorry, the word sorry, as well as seeming to be the hardest word, Thanks, Alton. (laughs) I I, I would sing it, but my vocal cords haven't been on rest this week. Um, You know, the word sorry holds so much power. In that word alone, there is stuff locked up. You imagine the word sorry is like a chest, and in that treasure chest that needs a key to open it, the, 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 the thing that opens it is the word sorry. And when you open that treasure chest, this is what's in it. Freedom. Forgiveness. Grace. Mercy. Because when we make mistakes, when we upset people, when we hurt people, when we say things we shouldn't say, when we do things we shouldn't do, which we have all done, saying sorry. Now, the thing is, Jesus never had to say sorry because he was perfect. So I can't really look at Jesus and and, and give you an example of when Jesus said sorry because he didn't have to because he was perfect and that's why his sacrifice was perfect. But Peter, he was like me and you. He was human. So he made mistakes. And in this moment, he's saying, I got it wrong, God. I got it wrong. Jesus, like, you've got it right. You know, I just want to sort of conclude my message. If Mick, you could... Come and join me, and we'll do a waltz. No, you'll play the keys. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting, this story, is because Jesus' response to what Peter says when he's like, oh, just everything, wash my head, my feet, my hands, give me a bath. Jesus' response is really interesting, and this is sort of what I want to conclude with this morning, this thought of Jesus' response to what Peter said. It's this. Jesus answered... Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. So, in this moment, this is what Jesus is sort of saying. And we'll put it into modern day context and the context of our lives. 
is that if you have come to a place in your life where you have said, you know what, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. I want to live like you lived. I am sorry and I need you. You had a bath. You were clean, cleansed. In that moment, Jesus washed you whiter than snow, the Bible says. It says, to use Bible language, you were cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. In that moment, you were clean, you were spotless, you were blameless. All your mistakes, all your failures, they were put aside. They were washed away. That's what happened at that moment. In church, we call that a moment of salvation. It's when people say you get saved. Basically, you choose in that moment to follow Jesus. You choose to be like, Jesus Actually, yeah, I got it wrong. You got it right. But then he says this, if you've had a bath, you just need to wash your feet. You see, and this is what happens as we walk through life is our feet get dirty. As we're just walking through our everyday life in the things we do, we might have made that decision to follow Jesus. We've had a bath and we're clean and we're righteous by, you know, what Jesus did for us, but our feet, they get dirty. And what we need to do is we need to actually go, actually, I need to wash my feet. I need to clean my feet because they're getting dirty. Life's just got a bit dirty. Life just got a bit messy. I got some muck. You're still clean. You're still a follower of Jesus. You've had a bath. This is what he's saying to Peter. Peter, you don't need a bath again. You don't need to get saved again. That's been taken care of. But Peter, you do need to keep your feet clean. You know what? This morning, I think there's, that, that we all fall into those two categories. Some of us this morning, we've never made that decision to follow Jesus. We've never come to that place where we say, actually, you know what? I am sorry. Like I said earlier, humility is the gateway to a relationship with Jesus because it does a few things. It says, I'm sorry because I've been doing it on my own and my way isn't right. And help. I need you, Jesus. And that's basically what happens when you decide to follow Jesus That's what you do. You humble yourself. You say, I I want to know Jesus. I want to be, I'm in. Whatever this is, this life, I'm in. I want to follow Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want a relationship with Jesus. Jesus sounds amazing. He sounds incredible. That's when you make that first decision. But then I think there's a few of us this morning, if we're being completely honest with ourselves, we've let our feet get dirty. It's been a while since we've actually gone to the presence of God. We've, we've come before Jesus and we've washed our feet in his presence. It's been a while since, since we actually said, you know what, Jesus, I, I'm sorry. I've been, making, I've been doing my own thing. I've been going my own way. I've been making mistakes. I've been a bit arrogant. I've been a bit proud. I've been a bit hot-headed. I've, whatever it might be, your feet have just got dirty because you've been walking. And when you walk with your sandals on, your feet get dirty. 